what is going on with the vinyl market right now? Um, that at least is what I hope to address. And I think that it's impossible to address this topic without kind of putting ourselves back uh, sort of early stage of the pandemic, even before that, and determine what was going on then, what happened during that period of time, and, and how does that lead us to now? So that's what I wanna focus on today. This is gonna be a little bit different than some of my videos because this is a little bit more of like an unstructured rant than anything that's probably gonna be that coherent. Before I dive into it, um, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and, uh, and we'll get started. All right, during the pandemic, a lot of people entered this hobby. I think we all know that. And they had a ton of time, and at least in aggregate, they had a ton of money. Um, and this wasn't limited to just vinyl in terms of where that money was being spent, right? So people were buying baseball cards, Pokemon cards, uh, original Nintendo games. The price of vintage cars went up during the pandemic, really was just across a wide variety of areas. And you don't need me to tell you why. Uh, I'm sure you know, it's because everyone was stuck at home. Uh, we didn't commute, some people weren't working, we couldn't spend time going out and doing maybe what our traditional hobbies are, like, I don't know, travel, going to restaurants, hanging out with friends, uh, etc. And so everyone gravitated to the internet um, and, and solitary hobbies, right? Like personal hobbies, like collecting. Uh, and, and they devoted all of that unused money that otherwise they would have been spending elsewhere, um, plus their government COVID checks that they were getting on collectibles like vinyl. So let's back this up just, to, just for a quick second. So this hobby in terms of collecting vinyl had prior to COVID been going on a fairly steady upward climb that was outpacing inflation. Uh, values, generally speaking, for jazz records had been going up since I would say at least the 1980s. Don't get me wrong, I was not collecting in the 80s. I was born in the 80s. But from what I know about since the time I've been collecting, as well as what was going on from talking to others, I actually have an uncle who's, who uh, has been collecting jazz vinyl since the 80s. Um, I, I know that that's basically the case. So when COVID hit, things accelerated. And this was because more people came to the hobby wanting to participate. And there was a scarcity of supply. Uh, so basically, there weren't enough records to meet uh, the demand. Now, there weren't enough records to meet demand before the pandemic either, but we're talking about a lot more people entering the hobby. More people creates more demand, uh, which drives uh, higher prices, right? So a lot more people were bidding on eBay. Uh, more people came to YouTube and Instagram to join the vinyl community. And the one thing that everyone was talking about was values. Uh, so this was at the same time that we were learning about all of those overnight Tesla and Bitcoin millionaires. And there was, there seemed to be this irrational sense that maybe we could spend the pandemic getting rich. So remember that labels don't make money from us buying vintage records, right? Makes sense. Um, and if demand for vintage exceeds the supply, why not fill the void with new releases? Uh, especially as some of these prior reissues were disappearing from stores and increasing his value, in value as well because people couldn't find the originals and so then they're going for the Black B Blue Note labels and the White B Blue Note labels and, and the values of all of those were going up as well, right? And because people's other alternative was to potentially spend hundreds of dollars on an original, why not put in the effort to make or at least brand your releases as high-end audiophile? Um, and this was already happening, again, as I said, before the pandemic with the Tone Poet series that had quite coincidentally been launched like, what, like November, right before the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, and obviously there were other labels that were doing it for a while, like Analog Productions, who've been doing it for decades. Um, but it really accelerated this idea of these higher end audiophile releases. It really accelerated just over the last two years or so, just, just really since COVID. And, and what they were banking on, I think, is the energy that people had for the originals being carried over to reissues. But how could they do that for a mass release reissue unless they release them in limited quantities, right? So it's impossible to find Quiet Kenny in its original form, and even if you do, it's a grand or two grand. So we're gonna release it, but we're gonna make sure that it's in limited quantities and we're gonna, we're gonna up the price a little bit um, to make sure that we can sell out, right? Because it's, it's important for them to sell as much as there is demand. Like that just kind of makes sense. They don't have excess supply, right? So kind of shifting gears maybe for just a second, um, something that was discussed on another YouTube channel, I wanna say it was Steve Westman's channel, was whether we had seen the last of FOMO, fear of missing out, 
within the audiophile vinyl community. Um, and I think that we have to some extent, and I'll say this, I think it carries over to not just audiophile vinyl, but all vinyl. I think the people who came to this hobby uh, just since 2020, let's say, have had enough. And the reason is the vinyl industry has made every single title a case of FOMO. So we're officially at FOMO fatigue. Um, announcing pressing quantities creates FOMO. Plus there are color variations. There's limited editions, retailer exclusives, record store days, sometimes multiple of them in a year during the pandemic. And they use this scarcity for every single release. How many labels have to announce a new series before we stop feeling that fear of missing out. Um, the hobby really did used to be one of two things. And I said this in like my second video that I've put out on YouTube. Um, it was either you gotta have the first press or you wanna have the pressing that sounds the best. Now, it feels like everyone needs everything and every variation from every series and every label. And it feels like it's becoming less about the music. But FOMO has extended itself to vintage vinyl as well. And this is where a little bit, I, I feel like to some degree there's some fingers pointing at me. So maybe this video is gonna seem like a little bit of the pot calling the kettle black, if you will. Um, so, so let me say a couple of things. First about, first about new vinyl than vintage. Um, so I generally don't keep multiple copies of titles. And generally I'm a first pressing collector. But these audiophile reissues just over the last few years have caused me to slightly relax that methodology, but not that much. I still don't have multiple titles of the same records except in certain circumstances, and even to the extent that I do a shootout comparison on YouTube is so I can decide which one to keep, not because I feel compelled to have everything, despite what it looks like around this room. Um, <laughs> I also haven't been increasing my purchases during the pandemic. I have not. Uh, if anything, any title I see online feels too expensive because it's so often literally the most expensive that I've ever seen the record. And I've absolutely no interest in getting in at the top of the market. So, so audiophile, um, you know, here's the thing. I think that there's a lot of good things that are being put out by these labels. And I think that there's a lot of things that if you want the music on vinyl, then it's important to understand whether it sounds good. That's all I'm trying to represent in some of my reviews and stuff. I'm not trying to advocate that people buy everything and that everything is a must own, that any serious collector has to have it. You'll never hear me say anything like that because uh, I think that's absurd. Um, from a vintage standpoint, um, th there's a lot of people frustrated. And the reason why is because folks who have been collecting vinyl even before me, let's say since like the 80s, they've been sitting on records that they paid $5 for, which don't get me wrong, still adjusted for inflation is, you know, it was like 20 or $30 or whatever. But, uh, but, but they've been sitting on like co very collectible records that they didn't have to spend a lot of money for. And people see those people post on Instagram and they're like, that is what's creating my anxiety about increasing my, like the size of my vinyl collection, or, or even, you know, so in, in my, you know, from my standpoint, I've been collecting now for over 10 years or 12 years, that I was able to buy something for $20 that's now worth 200, that simply me posting it on Instagram, that it's some, for some reason my fault for, for these people who are spending beyond their means and, um, and, and getting in over their head, feeling the need to have everything. So how did we get here and, and do I deserve some blame? Um, so let's, yeah, let's, let's start, how did we get here? <laughs> so cut to now, or really where, where are we right now? Um, at, the, at the beginning of January, I think was the pivot point. There were like three things that happened and you know what these are. Return to the office, rising interest rates and the threat of recession, kind of bucket those two together. And I've been stuck in my house for too long and I wanna take a vacation. Um, so return to office means that people are commuting, right? And I don't know about you, but I spend at least two hours of my day in traffic if I'm commuting into the office and sometimes three because I live in Atlanta and our traffic is terrible. So that's time that I could otherwise devote to this hobby. And that's one of the reasons why my videos, the quantity of my videos has gone down over the last uh, few months. So along with time uh, comes money on gas and vehicle maintenance. Also, when you're at the office, you're less likely to be doom scrolling on Instagram or TikTok wondering why you don't have that Oscar Peterson Analog Productions 45 RPM Title II, 
which by the way, no one cared about Oscar Peterson um, prior to the 45 RPM editions coming out. I mean, okay, I understand. People like Oscar Peterson. I like Oscar Peterson. His music is great, but not. But now everyone seems to pay attention to like every title and it's kind of ridiculous. Maybe Bill Evans is a better example. I don't know. Um, so, so okay, so, so that's one. Um, rising interest rates and the threat of recession is, is another. Um, a lot of people wanted to buy a house and delayed it during the pandemic because they didn't know where, where they were going to be, um, because they were switching jobs, because they thought that they could work remotely for the rest of their lives or whatever. Um, but interest rates continue to climb, as we all know, and everyone who refinanced right before the pandemic, I refinanced like relatively recently, you know, but before the pandemic, um, they, they realized that all those people who are refinancing at like 2% or whatever, at such a ridiculous rate, it created a lot of FOMO, bringing that term back in, from so many other people who expected to be able to buy, but then, but then they couldn't. Once, once they actually determined, now I know what's gonna happen with the pandemic and they actually wanted to buy, they couldn't. Um, so get this, this is actually a good like, you know, pr proof point. Um, if you bought a $300,000 house in 2020 at a 2.9% interest rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage, um, now, don't get me wrong. I don't know where you can buy a house for $300,000. Um, you used to be able to in Atlanta. I don't think you can anymore. Um, so you put 10% down, your monthly payment would be about $1,700 a month. If you took out the same mortgage today at a 7.2 interest rate, which is about what it is, about what you can expect to pay for a first home, uh, you'd be paying $2,400 a month. Um, so that's $700 more uh, expensive, and it all goes to interest, right? And not towards paying down your house. So what I'm getting at is that people are spending more on mortgages and rent or saving more for a down payment perhaps because the cost of borrowing is so high. They aren't spending $500 on the latest electric recording company title. They're, they aren't blowing their COVID checks on an original copy of Quiet Kenny either. All right, so then, then the other factor is getting out of the house, trying to do something different. Um, we aren't spending as much time at home, right? Uh, people are saving for vacation, and they certainly aren't spending as much time on social media and on auction sites. And I know this because I see my YouTube video views and I see my Instagram likes, but more importantly, I see my eBay auctions. And this is what I'm really getting to. So, so let me put it this way. Ask yourself if you think you can sell what you bought during the pandemic for the price that you paid. And I'm going to suggest that you probably can't. Um, here's the thing, most of us only pay attention to the high prices when we think of vinyl values. They never consider that the market price is not a single price, but it's really a wide swing of what something goes for on any given day, depending on the buyers at the table. The only people getting those high prices, generally, are the big dealers, like Funk U Sounds, right, or Carolina Soul, places like that, because they have the most eyes on their auctions. Um, I've been selling on eBay since 2001. I've been selling records on eBay since 2012. My auctions since January have gone for between 40 and 60% of what most people would consider market value. Um, and the reason why is because we have a false sense of what market value is. And that's unusual. During the pandemic, I was getting more like 90% of like market value or even like setting new high prices for records that I was selling. Now I'm serious. I'm getting 40 to 60% of what people think is market price because that's what like Carolina Soul gets. So it seems to me that we think that one that one time high price, which could have occurred for a variety of reasons, right, is going to also be supported every other time that the record sells. Um, think about those scarce record store day titles even. So as soon as the next thing comes along, whether the next record store day or the next release that everyone has to have, that record store day title that you paid $30 for that you think is worth $150 because that's what it was worth the day after record store day is probably going to be back you know, to being worth like $30 or maybe just a little bit over the original price if you factor in selling fees and taxes, you're probably gonna to have to pay um, on eBay sales this year. It's really just a wash. And I think that no one remembers that. They only remember um, that that $150 price point um, that the record was going for on that one particular day, at peak demand, by the way. For otherwise scarce used titles that come up for sale only seldomly, uh, just because one pops up and someone who's been waiting a long time for that particular title decides to splurge and pay more than market rate doesn't mean that that's the new market rate. It really doesn't. The market price is a window and sometimes it's a large window. 
Um, that's how you see a Carolina rec uh, Soul record sell for $70, let's say, and then my copy sells the next day for $25 and it's in the same condition. Um, well, it's that and because they have more bidders at the table, um, but both of our auctions are market price. It's just what they can command and, uh, and what I can command. And I think that this has always been the case, but I'm getting the sense that this is contributing to a lot of anger. And I'm not just talking about my anger. Um, I'm only frustrated, right? Most of the time, because I've been collecting for a while, I'm not, I'm not thinking about this like whole short-term profit gain of like flipping records. All right, so I think what I'm getting at with this video is a couple of things. One is what's going on with the vinyl market in terms of prices, and I think the other is people. I think people are playing a big role here. And I think that anger seems to be what has entered our hobby. It's always been there, but like especially since January. And I think it's a product of some of the other economic conditions that I mentioned. Um, people are extremely impatient right now, though, with any label that releases a product that isn't flawless. Uh, they complain about retail prices for some titles uh, being too high and then simultaneously pressing quality for other titles being terrible. And really the two are somewhat bound together. Um, I've also heard people complain about being forced to buy box sets uh, to get certain titles and blame labels for making people spend more money. Um, no, like, no, the issue is you don't need every title. You really don't. And, and right now, and again, since January, I don't think that these obscure titles are selling in the same volume. So in order to make it profitable for labels uh, to license and release, they have to group it with other titles in these box sets so that they can guarantee more revenue per purchase. So where does all of this leave us um, who still want to buy records and listen to music? Um, is buying right now a good idea? <laughs> I think it can be. But just like it was before the pandemic, records are not good short-term investments. Uh, and a lot of people came into this hobby thinking they were. I think the only way to buy is to ensure that your purchase price is either at or less than the value for the record, you know, like at or less your value for the record. And I think the only time you should be buying records is if you actually want to hear the music and you actually want to own it for a long time. Um, and, and that probably sounds obvious, but it feels like there's this overwhelming voice in this hobby right now um, of, of people who think otherwise, of people who are angry, um, and, and a lot of people I think are gravitating away to, uh, from the hobby, which may end up being a good thing, um, which is driving, which is bringing less bidders to the table, which is bringing prices down. So my opinion here is that prices are not down across the board. I've, and I think I've said this for a while, at least uh, over the last couple of years, the prices for the most collectible records in top condition will continue to be supported and possibly even continue to go up. Where I think that the uh, reductions are gonna be is I don't think that brand new vinyl is gonna sustain its price after the point of purchase and after, after the fact it's been opened. Um, I don't think reissues are gonna hold uh, their, their value as much. And I guess what I mean is like vintage reissues. Um, I don't think that they're gonna hold their value as much. And I certainly don't think that anything VG and less is gonna continue to be propped up because of all of these people that have to have a copy of everything. Um, so that's kind of my sense and my rant of what I think is going on in the market right now. Um, I continue to be very optimistic and happy person when it comes to this, uh, to this hobby. Um, and maybe it's because I'm not trying to get out of it. I'm not trying to make money on it necessarily. Every now and then I'll be, you know, I'm always buying and selling just so I can continue to afford the titles that I want. Um, but I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens over this coming year as people potentially gravitate away from the market um, and, and as, yeah, things just kind of change with, with less money getting thrown around. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens with the record labels and see how they react. So that is my somewhat unscripted rant that I wanted to record for you today. I'm really curious what you think about any of my points that again, I probably haphazardly stitched together and don't form a coherent argument as I said up front, but that's just kind of uh, what I wanted to do today. So let me know what you think. I'll see you next time.